Welcome to Modern Marketing Messages, the leading podcast discussing the latest and greatest in both online and offline marketing tactics, strategies, and trends. I'm your host, Taylor Karg, marketing content writer at AmericanEagle.com. Today, we're going to explore user experience, also known as UX, versus search engine optimization, also known as SEO. We're going to talk through the history of the two disciplines, the areas where they may clash with one another, and then we'll end with how, like many things in this world, such as a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, the two are better when they work together. So to discuss all things UX, we have here with us all the way from New York City, Danny Satiawan, Senior UX Architect at AmericanEagle.com, and to discuss all things SEO, Krista Bree, SEO Specialist at AmericanEagle.com. Danny and Krista, do you guys want to introduce yourselves a little bit, including your experience in your particular industries, how long you've been with AmericanEagle.com, and what you do for us here? Yeah, great. Uh, Taylor, thanks for inviting me to be on the podcast today. So I've been working with American Eagle as a SEO specialist and digital marketer for over two years. But uh, in my background, I have over 14 years in the digital marketing realm with a strong emphasis in SEO, working on a wide variety of different clients. So I think that today's topic is going to be really exciting. Hey guys, so this is Danny Sotianwan. I've been in the industry for about 20 years now. Started with uh, web when the web came into the picture. Uh, and then from there, it became UX. And I've been with AmericanEagle.com for over a year now, so it's been a really interesting uh, journey, and I'm excited to discuss SEO meets UX today. So I think before we get started into UX versus SEO and how they align and how they disagree, I think we should just talk about the details and quickly lay the foundation of what each is. So Krista, do you want to lay the foundation for us about SEO? Yeah, so just to give you a brief understanding of SEO, it, you know, what it stands for is search engine optimization. So most businesses are wanting to compete on the web and they want to get their exposure out there. So there are a number of things that need to be done on page and off page optimizations that will help a company get ahead or get what's called search engine visibility. So um, that's really where SEO comes into play. And when I talk to a lot of my clients about SEO and why it's so valuable is because you can generate leads organically through the search engine without having to pay for leads. So I always see it as a better value than doing PPC. I got gotcha. you. Danny, do you want to explain a little bit about UX? Sure. So... For these websites, right, we spend the effort, like what uh, Chris I just mentioned, to optimize the website, to bring traffic there, or even pay for the traffic to come in. And I'm sure you guys, or well, every one of us have experienced this. We come to the website excited to discover whatever we're looking for, and it doesn't work that well. It's not user-friendly. Or maybe it looks nice, but you just couldn't find what you're looking for. Right. So UX or user experience is the practice of applying design thinking to make a product, digital product, whether it's a website or an app, to make it usable and useful. So now that we know a little bit about SEO and UX, I'd like to talk about the history of the two disciplines. Where have they kind of interacted in the past and when did they start interacting with each other? Yeah, I'll, I'll kick that one off, Taylor. So really, you know, when the web first came about, everybody was so excited to get on the internet and to like connect to their dial up to jump <laughs> online to just do endless hours of searching on the internet. And if you had a business, you definitely needed a web page, but nobody really knew how to develop web pages or how to design web pages. So we were all working off like the basic HTML code and just throwing anything out there. Well, in the early days, and Danny, you might recall the early days, uh, you know, Google wasn't even around in the early days. Mm -hmm. So this was before Google came into the picture. We were using things like Yahoo.com and Ask yeah. Jeeves. And the Ask SU. Jeeves. Yeah. <laughs> Yahoo was the list, right? The list to get the, the web started, the browsing yeah, if you weren't using, if yahoo.com was not set as your homepage, you were not cool. You did not know what you were doing <laughs> on the internet if yahoo.com was not your homepage. Anyhow, um, getting back to where SEO really came into the picture, I remember, you know, when Google first 
came out and it started to get traction and, um, you know, everybody pivoted to only using uh, Google at that time, essentially. Everybody started to really migrate away from Ask Jeeves, AOL, Yahoo, and just start directly going to Google. So then it became the challenge. Well, how do I get my site in Google? How do I get my site ahead of these competitors? And then there was that Wild West period where people were just they found out that you could do something called keywords and then <laughs> keyword stuffing and putting in the metadata, your meta keywords. And then, you know, everybody was just fighting and loading a bunch of content on a page and didn't really care so much about what the page looked like as long as there was enough content there to get you the keywords into page one of Google. Danny, when did people start caring about what their page looked like? I think it started out like what Krista said in the beginning, the web, it was just text, right? And then we realized that, hey, to make it more engaging, to make people stay and consume more, we need to make it more interesting. And back then we designed using tables, believe it or not, it was interesting days of old. And, you know, like, we started making it more interesting. And then that's where we started also trying to figure out, okay, how do we connect the different content together to string along to become a journey as opposed to just like a dead end place where you go to one page and that's it. And that's where information architecture came into uh, the picture. It came from library science, believe it or not. And from there we say, oh, then how do we combine this with the visual to use? And that came from graphic design and that became UX. So that's how this whole thing, uh, came together and then with the whole what thing that Krista mentioned with the keyword stuffing and all these things that's where uh the graphic designer in me back then I was like oh why do we need all this that's unnecessary visual noise right but yeah so we'll talk about that more I'm, I'm sure but that's where like the two in the uh, in the old days that's where the two clashed well um you know Danny just to touch on that a little bit more is like when that idea came into place about having a better UX, remember your site wasn't cool unless you had Macromedia Flash with a cool intro and then like <laughs> all these things moving around on the page. <laughs> Can you explain to a, a millennial what the Macromedia Flash is? Because <laughs> I have no I, yeah, idea. Sure. Actually, that was the thing that got me into web because uh, it was... Macromedia before Adobe bought it. So, Chris, I used to remember Macromedia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From back so then. Was, so, we started up just links, right? So, we just had blue links. Back in the day, it was just blue links with underline, the bright blue link. And, and then we got pictures. And then we got animated GIF. It was the thing back then, animated GIF. <laughs> And then there is this Macromedia Flash animation, basically, that could make things more interactive. You could have like some uh, ease in and ease out, like you can have cartoons. Well, most of them were really bad cartoon or attempt at cartoon back then. And that was the thing that got me interested in this because my background, actually, I wanted to be an artist. I still paint these days. But I, as a visual artist, that was the thing that I found really fascinating is to add the layer of interactivity. Right. So that was Macromedia Flash, allowing it to do that. And then it became the thing that we could use to design the entire website with that. And that was probably a nightmare for SEO people, Krista. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And that was something that I was just going to drive the conversation into. Like Google wasn't able to read the Macromedia Flash back then. Um, and it was just more of bells and whistles for the site because users wanted to have that experience. They wanted to have that engaging, interactive experience on the web. But it also, you know, most of us were on dial-up connections back then. So the load speeds, I mean, nobody was even taking that into consideration, but people would wait because they wanted to see what was in that flash <laughs> file. Yeah, the, the most exciting thing was the, the loading animation, the looping loading animation back then because of the dial-up was so slow, the speed was so slow. That's the main thing that you see for the longest time. And like, okay, do I want to wait? And there is like a progress bar that shows 50%, 51%. The slow crawl <laughs> of the loading bar. <laughs> so lucky for a lot of us now, we don't have to deal with that much. 
Well, that's how we handled the page load speed back then. Oh, that was never an issue. We just showed them the loading bar and <laughs> said, here you go. If you, you want it, it's coming. It's really good. Wait for it. <laughs> 75%. Oh, wait, we're there. <laughs> so it, it was fun. It's perfect that you guys both kind of mentioned how SEO and UX clash a little bit. And I want to dig a bit deeper into how they clash and the areas that they clash. Because it seems like sometimes, you know, some building a website can be somewhat of a constant battle between optimizing for UX and then optimizing for SEO. So let's dig into these clashes. And wh when does optimizing for one negatively impact the other? Yeah, and I'll just, you know, I'll take that question first and just dive into it a little bit. But I think continuing that conversation from a flash loaded page perspective is that Google doesn't crawl that essentially because it is more programming um, front end or whether you're using even server side programming today. Uh, for example, a lot of websites are using uh, JavaScript and jQuery type um, on-page elements today. And Google has done a lot better job these days at being able to read some of that, but still it does hit complications where you run into problems where the crawlers can't really fully uh, grasp everything. So for example, I have a client and recently um, they had a light box pop up on their page, but it was connected to a link on their primary nav bar, but it was coded incorrectly on the developer side to where it was saying like JavaScript void as the clickable, where Google would just see that and it means nothing. It has no, you know, no value. Yeah. So really something like that would need to be sent back to a developer to recode it so it has some sort of value um, to define the actual link to the page it's supposed to take them to uh, rather than just that pop-up which has no value. So sometimes things like that, I think from a UX perspective, Danny, like if you wanted to have a light box pop-up or another uh, pop-up in place that a client might want, sometimes well, those are great for experience, but you have to consider when implementing those, um, you know, how how they're implemented. Yeah, a big part of it is like what Krista mentioned is because the crawler could see that only as a box. Mm -hmm. It has no clue what's in the box and it has no meaning whatsoever. And it's not adding any value to the page. So therefore the crawler thinks that the user won't get any value from that. And I think that was the issue with uh, the flash stuff, but also the flash objects that we had in the past, but also with these things that Krista mentioned, right? Bringing things that add more uh, engaging experience to the page that comes from a third party, for example. But on the page load, the crawler doesn't know what that box would actually give the user. So it's not adding value, but it could it could help with the user experience. But that's something that I encountered when I back in the day when I worked um, at Yahoo Finance when we did the chart. So we wanted the chart to be, uh, we actually used Flash back then for that still. <laughs> so the Flash chart was loading, but we added other stuff on the page to actually make, uh, help the crawler make sense of the page. We talked a little bit about this earlier. I think, Krista, you mentioned it, but what about um, keyword stuffing? And how does that kind of make SEO and UX clash against one another? Yeah, so definitely keyword stuffing is something that we would want to avoid in this day and age. Um, there is something that you want to look at or take into consideration when utilizing SEO best practices, which is what we consider as keyword density. So you want to be able to utilize your keywords, but you want to strategically place them so you're not overusing it or abusing it when it comes to SEO best practices. Um, from a UX perspective, uh, sometimes clients are unaware of this and they may they may overuse their keywords or they may be, it, most of the times they're underusing it is part of the problem. And that's really where I run into more of the bigger hurdles with the clients because they don't understand sometimes that SEO 
has to change some of the things on the page that the end user sees because Google wants Google's goal is to reward the value to the searcher based on their search intent. And if they're searching for this specific keyword, but you only have that keyword mentioned once or twice on your site because you feel like, oh, you wanna have a lot of marketing lingo on your site rather than really targeting your primary core product or what your site is really holistically about, um, then you're missing the opportunity to rank well just because you wanna have like buzzwords or keywords or marketing lingo per se on your homepage. Danny, do you have any other ideas of how the two kind of clash? Well, I think it's very, very much uh, aligned with what Krista said, right? So it's just a matter of understanding how the two work together and the intent of the Google uh, ranking. Google ranks certain sites higher because it considers that as more relevant to the connection between the intent and the actual content of the site that's delivering on what the user look for, that intent. Or there, the connection is strong, right? And this is going back to just a basic human conversation. And Google has uh, improved the algorithm. Krista, you can talk about this probably more and more and how the two are aligning more and more. So back in the days, keyword stuffing is simply like listening to sales talk when somebody just dropped like a bunch of jargon, just barfing jargon. <laughs> That's what keyword stuffing is essentially, right? So to, to fool the, the listener to think that, oh, this is about that, about that topic. But the other way is also the other, uh, the other extreme is also not good when you talk about certain subject. For example, imagine that we're having this conversation about SEO and UX and we don't even use the terms used in these two worlds at all. Then it's hard for anyone to uh, assess whether this is relevant or not to that, topic, to that subject. So I think the two uh, are really connected and then it's becoming less of an issue these days but sometimes we still have that issue with like like what krista said people just talking about it too much using the, the jargon too much or not but more in the in the less malicious or not malicious in a less uh i guess intentionally trying to fool the the, the crawler but more in a way that's just like that's their communication style that needs to be fixed. And that's why we help them here at AmericanEagle.com. Yeah, and actually to add to that, when it comes to designing new websites or redesigning websites on the web today, um, a lot of American Eagle's process is we, during that foundational strategy, we do look at SEO first. So, you know, as part of even putting together a, um, a site information architecture, we first do the keyword research to identify what are the best keywords to use. So this way, when the UX designer comes along and they say, hey, we want to make sure that these top level navigation items are going to be labeled with these keywords because things that are higher toward the top or above the fold when it comes to UX, um, Google actually rewards that more. So this is one of the ways that they actually complement each other. And that's how SEO with the UX go back to being hand in hand, I would say, um, you know, because it, 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 it comes full circle. And I think really having the SEO research up front is the most helpful thing to have when planning a redesign. I have two things to say here. One, I'm going to go back to when Danny said barfing jargon. I think that <laughs> is like the funniest thing I've heard in a long time. And two, Krista, both of you, you and Danny made a great point of how it just seems like success in one area just really leads to success in the other area. So I would, given that, I'd like to talk about, you know, the more ways in which they complement one, one another. Yeah, absolutely. So um, going back to the searcher's intent, uh, like I said, you know, Google keeps updating their algorithm and whenever new algorithm updates come come up, really the core um, the core goal of that algorithm update is to reward businesses that are um, putting themselves out there as an a, trust, a trusted authority 
figure in their space. So, you know, really having um, the correct keywords on your site and incorporating those keywords into elements on your user experience side. So user experience, we could say even adding alt tags to images that are relevant to the keywords on the page that correlates to the topic. That could be something that we could do from an SEO perspective that translates over to UX. Uh, again, buttons that are readable and crawlable. So when it comes to UX, we would want to have not just an image of a button, like that was another old school practice to just have an image versus now we have, you know, overlaid text over top of a button. So I think, mm-hmm. again, having more of that, go ahead, Danny. You can yeah, yeah, I was just going to add to that because again, going back to what we talked about earlier, if we use a an image as a button, then the crawler just sees that as a box. It doesn't know what the label of the button says, right? So if we use an actual button object and put a label on it, then it becomes meaningful to the search engine crawler. And also related to that, Krista, I'm sure that uh, you experienced this, the link that says here, the label, or click here. <laughs> click here. That was such an yeah. That's just the old web practices. Click here. Click here. <laughs> um, but yeah, that you know, in talking about that too, like this, this comes back to an internal linking strategy in SEO. So instead of just having something called click here, we would want to have the anchor text that's relevant to a keyword that we're trying to drive traffic to on that page that the link takes them to. So let's say if you have a, oh, I don't know, let's say if you have a page about toy cars and you would say, learn more to check out the about toy cars made in the 80s or something. And you could have that link say toy cars and it clicks over to a page highly relevant to toy cars. Therefore, you would be influencing the SEO value to Google that that specific page that you're linking to is relevant to toy cars. So Google would reward you. And so by doing an internal linking strategy, it does help accelerate a specific keyword that you're trying to elevate. My mind is like circling all of the blog posts I've recently done. And I'm like, am I linking everything correctly? (laughs) Um, I just want to add one thing to that. Uh, With the linking strategy, we start with researching the keywords that the user use to search to come to the website. In the UX, we also use that for designing the architecture of the website because that also signals to Google This is the scope of the website, what they could find here. So that's very useful to know. And a big part of that is also to use those actual terms in the navigation labels. Because that's very useful for users when they come to the website to just get an idea. Can I actually find what I'm looking for here? If they're looking for a toy car and then they see that in my navigation, then they would immediately think, oh, yeah, there's a good chance I'll find something that's good here. So in addition to searcher intent, what other ways do SEO and UX complement one another? Well, I think today, you know, everybody's, especially with recent Google algorithm updates where they're pushing page load speed, core web vitals, page load speed, core web vitals, you know, Google is kind of shouting this out, but they're not actually uh, having that as a primary ranking algorithm requirement right now, just looking at it based on my experience. Because I do see that some clients will pivot to put all of their time, energy, and effort into um, optimizing their page load speed and core web vitals. But when they shift focus from working on the on-page content side, their SEO keywords start to tank a little bit because they now shifted their focus. So I think although Google keeps continuously shouting it out, it is important. It's something that's going to be a driver more in the future. So I think they're just preparing you to be more ready. Um, But I do think when it comes to UX, uh, you know, just preparing sites, especially if you're developing new sites or you're getting your site redesign, then that is going to be something that uh, should be highly taken into consideration during the development process. Yeah, page speed is actually something that a lot of times uh, not considered as a UX 
thing, more like a development thing. Uh, but how many times you abandon a website because it's just too slow? Every time. <laughs> exactly. Especially uh, when you're on the go on the mobile, right? So that's when your tolerance level is super low. And you're like, oh, it doesn't load. Next one. Right. But Danny, there are things on the UX side that could be contributing to that increase in load speed, like let's say third-party plugins that, oh, I want to have this functionality. I want a chat bot. I want to have a popover. I want an exit pop. You know, just it, throwing all of those things in from a UX perspective does cause an increase to the time or the page load speed um, that, you know, we've been seeing from the SEO side. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. Those things are the, I'm going to use the term anti-UX actually, not the UX <laughs> stuff. That's a new one. <laughs> because when you're blocking people from completing the tasks that they come to the website for, for example, with like marketing uh, interstitials, right? That's a big one. Uh, that's when we as the UX designers need to actually balance the two. What are they here for? So this is the balance of the interests from the user standpoint and the business interest, right? And this is definitely something that uh, a lot of UX people are guilty of. Like we're putting in a lot of these things, like Krista said, because it makes the it it drives the business value, but sometimes at the expense of the user experience, actually. And that actually that leads to also bad SEO ranking right because now the two are more aligned more than ever and it's going in that trend it's trending that way more and more uh, so a lot of times actually in my experience getting that kind of uh, signal from seo person saying that hey this and this is hurting the ranking is actually a good thing to have so it's not like a negative thing in my opinion but it's more like a positive thing to bring to the client to even say hey we need to actually make sure that this and this work together so that we could deliver more value to your user so you can drive more you can actually extract more value for your business and also get more seo so everybody win i like that a win-win yes who doesn't <laughs> I know we've kind of talked about this throughout the entire podcast, but what are some ways to design a website that's optimized for both? And I know everything basically goes hand in hand, but is there anything that you guys can think of off the top of your head that, you know, doing this optimizes a website for both UX and SEO? Well, I think that, you know, what we touched on earlier, Taylor, was the fact that when it comes to getting a site redesigned, a lot of our upfront legwork that we do as far as strategy is a lot of research that goes involved with it. It's not just send it over to a designer and have them make something new. It's let's take a look at what's working. You have to dig into the mm -hmm. analytics and define what what's currently working for them and what's not working for them as far as a website. And then looking into, well, what keywords are they currently ranking for on Google? Because we want to make sure that when we're either rebuilding a website, um, you know, or optimizing a landing page, we want to understand what's working well so we don't lose value on that or identify things that, hey, you're sitting over here on page two of Google for this keyword. What could we do in our strategy to get that keyword elevated? Because that's going to get you a lot more impressions and clicks from Google. So with that being said, we would take that information and relay it over to a graphic designer in the form of an information architecture and helping them understand like our keyword mapping and what pages, what keywords are relevant to. So this way, uh, you know, when Danny picks that up, he will be able to arrange the headlines on the page to be consistent with what some of the keywords are, or he can design buttons on the page that have the text that are relevant to, you know, the keyword that's going to be on the next page. So it adds that internal linking structure. Um, but yeah, Danny, you can add a little bit more to what goes on behind the scenes when you're working on a new site. Yep. So 
from the UX process, we apply design thinking, right? Design thinking starts with empathizing with the end user, which is exactly what Krista just described. We need to understand why they even came here, right? Why they came to the website. And when we talk about design, a lot of times we only think about the visual element of it, the visual design, the graphic design. But actually design is something that is bigger than that. When we say this is well designed, what we're saying is that the intention of creating this thing or the intention of using that thing, that product, is to drive, to drive value for the user of it. And it does that well. That's when something is well designed, right? So we need to know what the intention is to start with so that we could actually deliver on that. The visual design, in my opinion, is probably the easiest part of this whole thing because if something is beautiful, it's looking really nice, it's, you know, everything looks very uh, aesthetically pleasing, but it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It's beautiful, but it's a beautiful garbage. Yeah. Well, you know, with that being said too, Danny, I like the way that you put that, like how the layout and how things are beautiful to look at and easy to digest and understand. Because you want, you know, I think from a designer's goal is as soon as the user hits the page within the first few seconds, you're supposed to be able to they're supposed to be able to understand what exactly is going on on that page Mm -hmm. or what it's about instead of getting lost in the shuffle. Um, I know that, you know, we uh, at American Eagle from a content strategy and an SEO strategy try to keep regular blog posts flowing um, with new content to capture on new keywords. But, you know, sometimes clients, they just have blog posts that are sitting out there that are not properly formatted. It's just a bunch of text. There's no headlines out there. So again, this comes with making it readable and consumable and skim and scannable. Like Google likes things that are easy to digest, that the font sizes are good, like all of these things matter from a UX perspective, but also from an SEO relevance because, you know, if if the font is too small, again, when you go down to mobile, it's not going to be very readable. If you don't have your buttons the right size on the page, your call to action, then that's going to flag an error in Google Search Console that the elements are not the right clickable dimensions, um, you know, and then Google also likes to see that you are breaking up that text. They want you to have headlines and subheadlines and bullet points uh, throughout mm-hmm. the content because they know that users on the web, especially using mobile devices, are most likely not reading the entire article from top to bottom. They're skimming and scanning and getting what they're looking for yeah. and leaving. So I think that's where making it look good comes into play. Mm-hmm. Well, looking good does not always equal something that's readable and digestible though yeah, true. That, yeah. right so something could look really good and flashy and maybe even uh they could even want a, a design award but it's not understandable well that right. it, you mean like from a readability standpoint like based on the content yeah, because it's like so much happening visually and it's interesting and using like mm-hmm. uh the fonts that are fancy looking good oh, but yeah. yeah it's not Readable, it's like from the readability standpoint, it's not understandable. Um, and I totally agree at the end of the day, the main thing is that the users, our users, ourselves these days, we don't have the attention span to read anything. We scan and skim. So yeah. if we don't get that, we don't engage the users within the first few seconds, gone, they're gone, right? And then even with that, the way people read now is not that they read one, you know, from top to bottom. Scan quickly, headings, 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 and say, okay, where do I want to zoom in? Zoom in and out that way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think they call that what the like the F style of reading, like up and down, left and right kind of uh, format. Yeah. That was, uh, I actually ob- observed this in person when we did uh, eye tracking oh, okay. exercise. So that's that's where it came from, right? So that's the heat map of the 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 eye movement. Yes. So up and down, and then they go to the right, and then they go down, and then to the like the F shape is shape is actually the the shape of the eye movement. 
Yeah, so that's interesting because when you design a page, you want to have your headlines and that above the fold area. So this way, again, going back to the keywords appropriate for Google for ranking, like easier for the user to see if that is one that they happen to search for in Google and click over to the page and then they directly see that that keyword is right there when they instantly hit the page then I think that that's what, you know, Google's rewarding that intent because the user's finding exactly what What they're they're looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, One one more thing I want to add to that from the UX perspective that relates to that keyword, uh, connecting with the keyword, is that sometimes for the the content writer, Taylor, uh, you guys tend to be too smart and too creative (laughs) with some of these keywords and not using the keywords that the user uses in there to find the content, yeah, right? To be witty, that could be actually a bad user experience. It'd be like, what the hell is this? Yeah, totally. And I was just going to say, I know as a writer, I've definitely struggled with that previously too. In some blog posts, I'm like, I need to go back and as I'm writing it, go through it and be like, okay, did I even include the keywords that I needed in this post? And sometimes I didn't. So that's always a good reminder that you know, we need to do this in order for it to be on Google and for, you know, to optimize for both UX and SEO. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, you know, definitely something to take into consideration as well. So not just not just what's on the front end, not about what we can do for SEO, but even from the content strategy, uh, it all plays a role into tying back. So they, they really just all mesh together to create a really good user experience to attempt to drive better conversions for the site. Yeah, totally. It's all one big full circle. Yep. (laughs) Well, that's about all we have time for today. Krista, Danny, thank you both so much for coming and talking on the podcast with me. I know I learned a lot and I'm sure our listeners will also learn a lot today. Thank you for having me. Likewise, thanks for having me. No problem. Thank you for listening to Modern Marketing Messages. For more information about the topics discussed today, check out the description of this episode. If you like this episode, follow this podcast wherever you listen to them to stay up to date with us. While you're at it, give us a rating and share this podcast with others. Don't forget to follow us on social media at Modern Marketing Messages. This episode is brought to you by AmericanEagle.com Studios. I'm Taylor Karg, and I'll be back with another Modern Marketing Message.